the use of uh, methamphetamine in Europe in the, in the bigger proportion, uh, the only thing we can say, it, it would start breaking very bad for all of us. Because if you look at the situation in the United States or the situation in Australia, New Zealand or Southeastern Asia, um, the damages that are associated for health and for the people using drugs, the damages that are associated to the use of uh, methamphetamine can be huge. Um, and certainly this is something we need to anticipate. Not so much talking in terms of threats uh, or expanding the concept or the notion of threat, which is not only a threat for the society or, or for all countries in the EU, but a threat for the health of people who would be using those substances. So uh, the, the importance of adapting our approach for prevention, uh, the need to adapt our approach of treatment and the offer of treatment uh, is, uh, is depending also for a better and more precise knowledge of what is changing. And this is why here we have, uh, 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 first we have Norman Holler that I, I would like to thank for, for his participation, who is the author of a very important book uh, about uh, some historical uh, uh, foundations of uh, consumption and produ production and consumption of pervity. Um, we have uh, the Czech Republic with Pavla and Victor, um, and there the use of pervitin uh, is also quite historical for many years. And when the uh, Czech Republic was preparing to join the EU, well, basically the, the main problem as far as drugs were concerned in Czech Republic uh, 25 or 30 years ago was the injection of pervitin rather than opioids. Uh, so, and I, I think uh, Pavla will share with us, I, I think pervitin is still a problem in, in the Czech Republic. And then uh, with Esther and Gabriela, uh, we, we have the opportunity to open a window and to, have to, to shed light on something that may look limited in its importance, but is fast changing. And I remember uh, a discussion with uh, Juan Villalbi, who's the uh, Delegado del Gobierno para el Plan Nacional sobre Drogas. We were together in a conference on addictions last year, and he was explaining to the participants that uh, in the beginning, some years ago in Catalonia, uh, when there was a, uh, the, uh, the appearance of, uh, uh, of uh, use of methamphetamine, uh, and the colleagues will tell us more about this, this was more focused on people uh, doing chemsex, but apparently, and this is why we need uh, to further adapt our monitoring system, uh, uh, it appears that for the moment, the consumption of methamphetamine is most probably expanding beyond the, the, the limit of the group of people practicing chemsex. So there is a potential for further spreading and, and before to call for measures to be taken or for responses to be adapted, uh, certainly there is a call for better understanding uh, the reasons, the causes, but also how people consume, why and how, uh, and, and as it is, and you know that the, the, the narrative we present for the drug situation in Europe is everywhere, everything and everyone, meaning drugs are everywhere in Europe, not in the same proportion, but there was never so much and so many drugs available in Europe. The second is uh, well illustrated by the topic of today, which is everything can be used as a drug or so be the, 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 the cause of an addictive behavior. And we have here an emerging phenomenon that may still look anecdotal if we refer it to the 450 millions of inhabitants in the EU, but where there is a problem and for people who have the problem, they have it 100%. So it, this is why it deserves our attention. And finally, it means and again, uh, we will learn from our colleagues from Catalonia uh, uh, what is the situation there. We see that uh, this everyone can be, uh, can have uh, or be the witness of someone having a problem of addiction uh, is uh, because it's not only about opioids and heroin and there are much more substances involved. Uh, today, we have different groups of people uh, that we don't know for some of them. Uh, that, that are consuming uh, methamphetamine. And therefore, it's, uh, this webinar today is playing a bit the role of a kind of a early warning. Um, 
not only for decision maker or makers or to ask for security measures, but also an, again a warning for us that building on the lessons learned from 30 years of uh, drug policy in Europe, we need to adopt uh, our understanding of what drugs are today if we want first to avoid to miss some emerging problems and if we want to be able to adapt the responses to be still helpful because the ultimate goal of our work is, uh, is beyond just drug policy support, is to be helpful for people who are using drugs and their families where it, and for the society and the communities where it is needed. So thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, with this introduction, uh, I'm happy to, to give the floor to the chair of the webinar today. Victor, it is your yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello to everyone also from my side. I am in the Department of Addictology, the oldest addiction treatment center in, in Czech Republic. I don't need to remind you that the pervit in methamphetamine is a very important topic for Czech Republic because it, it is in the center of drug problem for, for many years. Alexis covered uh, almost everything, uh, all, all important aspects of our today's snapshot into the methamphetamine. So we'll have three presentations and four speakers. So first, it's Norman Ola, uh, writer, journalist, uh, who will introduce the history of pervitin methamphetamine in Germany. So we will have the uh, insight into the past. Uh, Pavla Khominova will continue with the, also a bit of past of methamphetamine in, in Czech Republic and the um, present situation. Um, and uh, the last one will be the snapshot into the situation in Catalonia, as uh, Alexis already mentioned. So we will have Gabriela Barbalia and Esther Aranda who will inform us about the recent development of methamphetamine issue phenomenon in, in Barcelona, in Catalonia. So uh, I think we can start. So the first question is to Norman. Uh, what are the origins of methamphetamine in Europe? What is the history of pervitin in Europe, in Germany, and um, okay, in, in, in Europe, in a broader perspective, maybe? So please, Norman. Thank you. Um, I was first um, in touch with the phenomenon of methamphetamine in around 2010 when I spoke to a friend of mine and asked him, what should I write my next book about? And he said, you should write about the drug abuse during the so-called Third Reich when the Nazis were ruling over Germany and big parts of Europe. And I said, what drug abuse are you talking about? Because I had always thought that the Nazis were a very anti-drug regime. Um, so I, I decided to, uh, I actually asked him, how do you know that the Nazis took so many drugs? And he told me um, that a friend of his uh, is an antique, uh, was an antique uh, dealer in Berlin, and he had um, bought an old cabinet um, from an old East Berlin apartment and found original pavitine packages in that old cabinet. So they must have been 60 to 70 years old. And my friend, who is a DJ, uh, is, was adventurous enough to actually try them. And uh, he said that they had a very strong drug effect on him. And this, uh, this story was strange enough for me to actually start um, serious research. And um, uh, one of the first, um, so because then I, I thought this, on the, on the one hand, this was a, a legal product in, in Germany at the time. On the other hand, crystal meth is this illegal drugs. So how does how do the how does this work together? What's the what's the connection? So this is this was the starting question uh, of this book, uh, which in English is called Blitzed, in German is called Der Totale Rausch, and which was published in 2015 and then later in, in different translations. So what I've I became very interested in this contradiction between my grandfather telling me under Hitler there were no drugs and um, suddenly this pavitine package, which obviously contained a very strong drug. Um, and the first research that I started actually showed that indeed um, the Nazi regime was one of the first regimes in Europe who had a very strict anti-drug policy. Um, they did not invent new anti-drug laws, but they took the old uh, 
opium laws from uh, the Weimar Republic in Germany, but enforce them in a way that in which they have not had not been enforced before. So suddenly in 1933, the government said we will be an and we will be a, a drug free society and um, the, these laws were strictly enforced. Um, drug users were 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 criminalized and um, the, the, the early concentration camps uh, in Germany in Nazi Germany already had some drug users uh, as as inmates. So there was a complete policy shift between the Weimar, Weimar Republic, which ended January 30, 1933, and the Nazi regime, which lasted for these unfortunate 12 years. Um, so now it's even more interesting how does suddenly Pavitin um, come into play. Um, my research showed that the Olympic Games in 1936 in Berlin were in a way a game changer for that. They, they are reported to have been the last doping games where there was no effective doping uh, controls or checks in place. Uh, and there were rumors at the time, and I have tried to confirm these rumors, but I have not been successful. I, there's simply no documentation on this, but there were rumors at the times, so at least these rumors are documented. Um, that one American athlete, um, Jesse Owens, who won, I think, six gold medals to the big surprise of the Nazi regime, which uh, because he was Afro, he's, he was an Afro-American. So um, the idea that um, in Nazi ideology, an inferior race could run faster and jump uh, high, uh, better than uh, an Aryan superhuman was uh, caused to concern and discussion. And um, one leading uh, 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 developer of, of medicines at the time was Theodor Temmler. He owned the Temmler factory in Berlin. And after the Olympic Games, he um, had a talk with his chief chemist, Fritz Hauschild, uh, to develop a stronger, um, well, the, the rumor was that Jesse Owens was using Benzedrine which was an amphetamine, a legal amphetamine at the time, legal in the United States. And uh, it, was, uh, it was rumored that only because of benzodrine he was able to perform better. So Theodor Temla said to Hauschild, this can never happen again. We must have a German answer to this. We must find a better amphetamine. And then Hauschild, the chemist, um, actually um, did some research and he found out that in 1917, um, a Japanese chemist called Nagai had synthesized um, this stronger version of amphetamine, which is methamphetamine in Tokyo. And then Hauschild um, found an, his own way of synthesizing uh, methamphetamine. This was patented uh, in October 31st of 1937 and then branded by the Temla company as Pavitin. And then Pavitin came onto the market in Germany uh, in 1938. And um, I did some research in the, um, in the um, uh, Landesarchiv here in Berlin, where the, the, all the, company, uh, the, the companies of Berlin that were located in Berlin have their, you know, their files. And uh, I, was, uh, I could see very clearly that um, the Temla company uh, had a big hit with Pavitin because the sales skyrocketed. I also could see exactly how they advertised it. And it was a very professional approach. They were not sure in the beginning what pavitin actually is good for. Um, the, uh, the, the pharmacological tests with animals showed that there was a, an increase, uh, an, an, an energy increase, or there was more you know, movement and um, the animals also became more aggressive. Um, but it was not really clear how this um, how this would work with humans. So um, there was a lot of testing actually within the Tem Temla company. The chemist Hauschild himself and his assistants, they took it and they um, at the time were not concerned with addiction or negative side effects. They were actually concerned with positive uh, effects and um, they found that it's stimulating, that it increases your mood and increases your sexual appetite. It was, it was like a, a great pill to take, basically. That's how they perceived it. Um, and, uh, but to get wider you know, responses, they, uh, the Temla company 
uh, launched, um, first of all, a big ad uh, campaign. There were posters everywhere in Berlin advertising this new thing that was good against depression and just gave you a little boost of extra energy. And, um, you know, thinking of, you know, Nazi Germany, seeing Nazi Germany as a modern performance driven society, just like any capitalist society also today, any performance enhancing drug, if it really is performance enhancing, which was thought of at the time that pavitin is performance enhancing, obviously is interesting um, because everyone is part of the, of the rat race of, you know, competing with other individuals. So Pavitin was um, kind of a better Coca-Cola or it was, you know, they wanted it to be like a, a pill that's like a Coca-Cola. You don't, you know, you know, you take it in the morning and you're more happy, you're more awake, you're more eager in meetings. So it, it spread across uh, various, you know, basically all um, sectors of society from intellectuals, artists, our actors would take it before they go on stage. Uh, it was reported of writers taking it to write the whole night, uh, but also factory workers could increase their, their output at the assembly line. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a point when even a chocolate came onto the market called Hildebrand Pralinen, and each little chocolate had nine milligrams of pure uh, methamphetamine in it, so quite a high dosage. And the slogan was, um, Hildegard Pralinen erfreuen immer. Hildegard uh, chocolates always a delight. And they were specifically marketed for housewives. Um, I mean, the role of women uh, during the Nazi regime was um, was not a role of you know empowerment, and uh, it was not a, They were not on equal stands standing with with the men. Kind of. A, I mean, Weimar Republic also was a patriarchal society, but still women had more involvement uh, in the society than during Nazi times when Hitler or the, the ideology basically said women have to go have to stay at home to take care of the children and uh, and keep the house clean so with these Hildegard chocolates that they were at least you know kept happy doing that it's kind of what the Rolling Stones in the 60s uh, when they when they said uh, when when they were talking about mother's little helper uh, the pill that um, that you know makes your dull uh, everyday life uh, a little bit easier and lighter. So Pevitin was uh, in fact a big hit. Um, the Temla company also sent letters to, um, they said each important doctor uh, in Germany, I don't know if they really managed that, but also big hospitals, they all received this um, you know, propaganda material from Temla saying this is a great new medicine and please write us back how it works on your patients. We want to, you know, improve our you know, uh, information leaflet on your on your input. So they got a lot of feedback. Also, German universities um, examined Pavitin. Um, and they came, like I studied all these uh, reports from these German universities, they, they, they were quite happy about Pavitin. They, they said it increases the mood, it lowers depression, um, it, um, uh, it decreases the fear level, for example, it decreases inhibitions. So it seemed like a very interesting uh, medicine actually um, at the time. Um, and then um, just to, to uh, sum up kind of the historical, uh, that, that, that sum up, I uh, discussed the last chapter of the Pavitin news in the Nazi regime. Then a professor in Berlin called Otto Ranke um, also heard about Pavitin because it was quite known at the time. And he was the um, physiologist uh, of the army. So his job was performance enhancement of the, of the Wehrmacht, of the, of the army of the Wehrmacht. Um, the German army. So he, his, he was obsessed with the, an enemy that he tried to defeat uh, at the time. This was in the, in the late 30s, but before the war against uh, Poland started in 38. His, his, the enemy that he wanted to defeat was fatigue. So he was looking for ways to keep soldiers awake for a longer period of time. So when he read studies from universities where they had actually tested that pavitin Methamphetamine keeps you awake for longer uh, for longer hours, and if you don't take it, you know, similar to drinking coffee, but more in a more extreme way, 
he thought that this might be an interesting um, substance uh, for the German army. And he worked for you know, turning pavitine into a legal, no, I mean, it was legal already, but he, he, wa he wanted to turn it into um, uh, uh, a supplement that every soldier basically has. The, 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 the medical officers should all carry in their medical bags and then hand out. And um, this was uh, a concept basically of a modern, the modern soldier. He saw the modern soldier as this you know, machine that you know, just needs to work as efficiently as possible. And pavitine seemed to be, seemed to be helpful here. Um, so he conducted um, tests in the um, Sanitätsakademie, that was the academy, where, medical academy of the German army, where he was uh, leading the Institute for Defense Physiology. Um, he made um, three extensive tests there, which are very well documented uh, with young medical officers. And he started these tests uh, in the early evening and they lasted all night until the next afternoon. And he, he found that actually people on Pavitine were able to not only stay awake uh, the whole night uh, without symptoms of fatigue, but actually solve a lot of you know, quest, you know, questions. He had all these tests for them. Um, and he came to quite an interesting conclusion uh, because after you know, carefully evaluating these tests, he could see that people on Pavitine are able to um, do much more, but they actually don't do it in a better way. So it also lead it also led to mistakes like in mathematical calculations, um, or especially in um, exercises that um, are more complex to solve. So the the the, the more difficult a problem to, is to solve, the more mistakes happen on pavitine. While very simple tasks, like very mechanical simple tasks can be done better on pavitine because you just have a, a longer, you know, you could, you could do them for a longer period of time. So he concluded this is perfect for the soldier who's not supposed to think, but is just supposed to, you know, do what he's told to do. Uh, so with this um, conclusion, he went to his superior, the surgeon general, um, the, um, uh, of, the, of the German army. This was just before the war against Poland started. Um, but in the German in the German high command, they did not quite understand yet what Otto Ranke was trying to do. So and also they were busy with you know, preparing the attack on Poland, which started uh, the Second World War. So um, his proposal first didn't get through, and then he studied what happened actually in the in the attack on Poland. He wrote to medical officers in the field asking for reports back. Did, was pavitine used? What were, what were the effects of pavitine? And in fact, a lot of um, common soldiers brought pavitine with them, based pri on, privately basically bought it in pharmacies in Germany and just brought it with them because they knew if I take this stuff, I can work longer or fight longer. Um, so soldiers have this, probably this instinct that anything they might, that they think that might help them fight, they, they're probably eager to take it. So pavitine was used quite a bit in the attack on Poland. Again, Ranke um, wrote a report about this and said, if there will be new campaigns, because he knew that there will be, would be uh, an attack in the West, um, we should, we the German army should have this um, organized and uh, there, there should be you know, it should not be unregulated because it is a very strong and potent substance. So there should be a regulation for it. And he wrote the so-called stimulant decree in April, 1940, where he laid down rules on how much the German soldier should take in case, in the, in the, in the case of, if, uh, of an attack in the West. Um, Temla then was uh, received the, um, the order of uh, 35 million dosages of pavitine just before the attack on France. And uh, when on May 10th, 1940, Germany attacked uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, Holland, and then later in France, um, the pockets of the medical officers were filled with uh, pavitine. And from that moment on, pavitine started spreading. And I, actually, I, sh I should mention that pavitine was first tested even before, uh, namely when um, the so-called Sudetenland was occupied uh, by, by the German army. 
uh, in uh, uh, March 1939. So this is how Pevitin first left uh, German territory. So the first, you know, foreign place it actually reached was uh, was what is now the, the Czech Republic. And maybe that is connected to, um, that might be a connection uh, interesting to, to look at uh, on why Pavitin is so known. Even the name Pavitin, like in other countries in Europe, you don't say Pavitin, you say methamphetamine, but in the Czech Republic, you actually do say Pavitin. Um, but uh, basically Germany then spread Pavitin all over uh, Europe with their conquests. And um, this is, um, in rough words, um, how uh, pavitin originated and then how it was uh, distributed. And uh, yeah, so this is my my rough intro. My, not my rough. This is my introduction to the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norman, for uh, for this interesting story on the, the onset and the history of of, of, of pavitin. In Germany, and then one could say, Pervitin was forgotten for years, and a group of explorers, uh, users in, in in Prague, in Czech Republic, rediscovered how to produce it using this Japanese way, probably linked to Pervitin, and then the history of uh, the Czech Pervitin, Czech methamphetamine started in 70s. So now I would like to pass the floor to Pavla on the presentation, for the presentation on the situation in Czech Republic. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, uh, Alexis. Thank you, Norman, for having this introduction to the topic. It is a really great pleasure to be here with you today and uh, to have the possibility to share the situation in our country with you. So I will focus mainly on methamphetamine use in Czechia, but uh, it also needs uh, some historical background or historical information. Uh, I will start with uh, summarizing some kind of situation, what happened after the World War. Uh, the drug started to be available not only in Germany, as already Norman mentioned, but uh, in other countries as well, but also uh, in the United States. There was a situation that the chemist uh, Stephen Preisler published a book in 1970s. Uh, the book was called Secrets of uh, Methamphetamine Manufacture. And this is also how the drug became more popular and the more used in the United States in 1970s. And uh, I also would like to mention that uh, the methamphetamine and pervitin, as, as we call it in the Czech Republic, was uh, not illegal until 1970s, and it only got into the international prohibition in this time. What uh, makes uh, Czechia specific uh, about methamphetamine use? This is a question that we are always asked. Everyone knows the connection when you say you come from the Czech Republic. So this is the first question you ever receive. So what is the situation with methamphetamine? Why is it so popular in your country? Uh, at first, I would like to say that since the 1950s, uh, there was a situation in the Czech Republic, uh, which was called like the Iron Curtain division between East and West Europe, which lasted uh, until 1989, when this uh, Velvet Revolution took place and uh, Czechia or Czechoslovakia, as we were in that time, just became a more... Uh, free country and more democratic, but until then it was a socialist regime. And in this kind of regime, no drugs were imported to the country. There was a really low availability of uh, drugs that were available in other European countries, opioids and so on. And uh, what the users had to do, they had to rely on substances that were available in the country in that time. 
So in the 1940s, uh, the use of benzedrine was quite popular among users in our country. At the end of 1950s, uh, the historical sources mention uh, ephedrine-based uh, stimulant called Yastel. In the 1960s, uh, there, are, there were signs of use of uh, dexfenmetrazine. And then uh, since 1970s, uh, we have this reappearance of methamphetamine in the Czech Republic, which was ephedrine-based at first, and later the production changed, and now it is more pseudoephedrine-based. Uh, pervitin was not the only drug that was used in our country since 1970s. Uh, we also had uh, some opioids, but uh, these were also some opioids that could be based on the home production. And we had the brown opioid called brown, which was uh, based on codeine. As already mentioned uh, by Victor, uh, the drugs were, in, in 1970s, uh, the users or inventors, they, they discovered this process of uh, production of uh, methamphetamine. And uh, since 1970s, uh, most of the pervitin production in, in our country was homemade production usually based on uh, ephedrine. The source of the drug was uh, cough drops, uh, sultan, which were available in pharmacies. And then later it was uh, ephedrine, which was smuggled from uh, one chemical plant that was producing ephedrine. This uh, chemical plant is uh, or was located in uh, one small city just near Prague, one train stop from Prague. And uh, this is how ephedrine was uh, getting out of this plan and used for methamphetamine production. What happened among the users, the know-how on production was shared with like among small groups of users. And uh, these small groups of users were gathered around one person that uh, had the skills or abilities to cook pervitin. And uh, the drug was usually not sold, but it was only shared within this small group. So it was based on some barter exchanges. Someone got some um, chemicals for production. Someone else got something else. Someone else was uh, able to cook it. And, and then the drugs produced were shared within these uh, groups. And this is uh, what the situation was uh, until 1990s. Uh, then, as I said, after the Velvet Revolution, the, the borders opened and the drug market started to develop uh, in a different way. But still, this homemade production of pervitin remained in the Czech Republic and the uh, methamphetamine stayed uh, like the number one drug among high-risk drug users in the Czech Republic. Nowadays, uh, the production is uh, based on pseudoephedrine. It is extracted from uh, medicines that are usually available in, in pharmacies. These are medicines against flu. And uh, these are sometimes imported also from other countries, but also uh, used from, from the market and pharmacies. Uh, if someone is uh, interested in some more reading about the history, then I recommend one paper from uh, prepared by Tomasz Zabranski. And also we produced a chapter for a book, uh, which was focusing directly on the crystal met. It's a German book, so I can recommend readings in both English and German. But now we will move uh, to the present situation. Uh, what is the situation now? As I said, uh, methamphetamine still is the number one drug uh, used among high-risk drug users. There is estimate of nearly 45,000 people who use drugs in the Czech Republic. Just to remind you, we are a country of 10 million people so that you can somehow compare it with your countries. 
and uh, three quarters of, uh, of these uh, drug users are pervitin users. Uh, monitoring of the situation started in more detail in 2001-2002, so the first estimates of uh, problem drug use in, in the Czech Republic come from this time. There was about uh, 20,000 people estimated to be high-risk drug users in that time. Nowadays, or pervitin users, nowadays we have 35,000 estimated. About 90% of uh, pervitin users or all high-risk drug users use drugs by injection. And uh, this is why uh, methamphetamine is a, a real issue because it has a huge uh, health uh, health related uh, consequences, but also social correlates as regards to health consequences. The most severe ones include overdoses. Uh, in our country, we have about 10 to 20 cases of uh, overdoses annually, which are related to pervitin use. And then we have about 30 to 50 other indirect uh, deaths that are related to methamphetamine use. What is uh, quite an issue recently, so it's a uh, it's, uh, psychiatric comorbidity, uh, which is uh, discussed. It is estimated that uh, nearly two thirds of clients that are in treatment, so they suffer from psychiatric comorbidity. As it's mentioned in the slides, there are symptoms of intoxication, aggressive behavior, paranoia, psychosis. So there, there is a real, a lot of uh, huge health consequences. But uh, we do not only monitor the situation uh, of uh, this high risk uh, substance use. We look also to the situation in general population, in other specific populations, to somehow capture if there are some new trends, new situations in some specific populations that uh, need some concern or that would mean that something is uh, going on or trends are changing. So what we do is uh, monitoring in the general population, as you can see that in the long term, the prevalence of uh, recent use of methamphetamine is uh, relatively stable, relatively low, slightly higher among young adults, but uh, recently it seems it's slightly decreasing. What we were also interested in, because we, in the long term, we uh, surveyed the substance, like one category for pervitin and amphetamines in one category, and we decided to look more closely on what is the type of the substance people are using in the country, and now we have also new estimates specifically for methamphetamine use. As regards use in the specific populations, we, in the long term, we survey um, student populations. We have data from the ESPAT study um, in the long term since 1995. We have data available on, on experience with uh, methamphetamine use in school population. We also looked at the uh, like a higher age of the students, 18 year olds, to, to see if there are some differences or what is the situation uh, in relation to the age of the respondents. What we see, we see higher prevalence of use of pervitin in some specific populations, mostly in prison population, and also in socially excluded localities. You can see that the prevalence of use reported is much higher compared to what is reported by general population or student population. And what uh, seems uh, quite an issue, and it was already mentioned by colleagues, uh, it is this use in recreational settings and also use of pervitin in the context of chemsex. 
these are data from the year 2016, 2017, which refer to last 12 months use and last four, four weeks use. So you can see everything is quite used uh, in the context of uh, hemp sex as well. What we know about methamphetamine users in treatment, so we have also data available in the long term on the treatment. We know that in outpatient treatment and also in residential treatment, methamphetamine users create about 11% of uh, the, the clients. If we do not count alcohol, so and we would look only on illicit drugs, so they account for about 26 to 28 percent of patients in treatment. The situation is uh, different in uh, low threshold services. So we can see the situation from the year 2006 till now. And nowadays, uh, about 70% of the clients of low threshold centers are methamphetamine users. Oh, sorry. Uh, what we can say about interventions to, for methamphetamine users, as mentioned, they are clients of all types of services. They enter inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment. They appear in low threshold services, but mostly because uh, most of them are injecting users. So the service they use the most is the needle and syringe exchange programs. So within uh, the services of low threshold centers, they are offered also some specific interventions like uh, gelatin capsules that are distributed to users to, uh, to offer them as an alternative to injecting use. And uh, all of our low threshold services offer this kind of service for the users just to help them to prevent from, from injecting or help them to, to change the mode of uh, administration. Recently, uh, there is an off-label substitution offered uh, with methylphenidate. It, is, uh, it was uh, approved as a pilot, uh, pilot intervention. There are recommendations of the Society for Addictive uh, Diseases of the Czech Medical Society, but still uh, there are uh, there are just cases of uh, of users, methamphetamine users, that enter this kind of substitution. There are also some short intervention programs that are based on cognitive behavioral therapy, and uh, these are spread across a few of the services view of the programs. Very briefly, a few words about the market and crime. The market situation changed in the 1990s. Uh, the market started to be more open, but still domestic production of uh, pervitin prevails. There is an estimate that uh, six and a half tons of methamphetamine are consumed annually, mostly within the country, but some of, uh, of this amount is also exported to, to other countries. Every year, as you can see some picture from that were taken by police uh, within the dismantling of the laboratories. So it's mostly really home production. You can see like really kitchens. That's why we call these kitchen labs. And about 200 of these small kitchen labs were dismantled in, in the last year. Uh, most of them, like half of them, was really this home, home producing laboratories with the small scale production. But there are signs of increase in number of labs uh, with a higher amount of uh, pervitin being produced. Uh, we have reported like 900 seizures of uh, methamphetamine in the country with 30 kilos seized. Uh, so if you can compare the seizures with uh, the whole production, you can say see that uh, it is really small 
still a small part of the market. And this is uh, all for, for my side. I would like to once again thank you for having the chance to share this uh, situation in the Czech Republic with you. And I'm really enthusiastic to see what's going on in other European countries and to hear what's new in Spain. And also, I'm happy to answer questions you will have about the Czech Republic. Thank you. Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you, Pavla. Uh, uh, well, uh, you can see that uh, also the history of Pervitin in Czech Republic is quite uh, um, uh, interesting and it's not uh, homogeneous. Yeah, that there are developments in the past, there are also some stimulant use before. Methamphetamine, uh, pervitin, as such, the market has changed. The uh, patterns of use has changed. Also recently, uh, with methamphetamine going into nightlife setting. So now we have a chance to to see what's going on with methamphetamine in Barcelona, in Catalonia. So question is: Is methamphetamine use seen in other countries, and what's the situation in Spain? and the challenges related to methamphetamine there. So please, my colleagues, you can continue. Okay, thank you, Victor. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning from Barcelona. I would like to uh, take the chance to thank to the MCDDA, especially to Marika, Alexis, Alessandra, for bringing us all together to this interest, interesting webinar and um, for giving us the opportunity to show some of the work we are doing. And most importantly, to, to learn from other experiences such as the one uh, Pavla has explained us now. Uh, I would like also to thank to all my colleagues in Barcelona for giving me their input from the front line, which is very important for this webinar since Methamphetamine has recently or relatively recently introduced here. Um, so in trying to answer this question, um, we will try to give a city perspective uh, rather than a country perspective as, as Pabla did. So we will focus on Barcelona, which is one of the city in Spain with a predominant harm reduction model. Um, before I begin, I would like to sound uh, a note of caution regarding monitoring of illicit drugs in general and methamphetamine in particular. So as we all know, drug markets are complex and dynamic systems, as Alexis a little bit explained at the beginning. And despite uh, having relatively good monitoring system here in Spain, particularly in Barcelona, uh, it is very difficult to put all the pieces together and know exactly what is going on when it comes to uh, drug markets. So um, in order to answer this question, uh, please be aware that we are often only having uh, bits of information of the reality we are trying to understand. So, um, however, not having the big picture uh, doesn't mean that we should um, not doing action intervention activities and making decision in order to try to meet uh, the needs of the methamphetamine drug users. So um, in Barcelona, we detected three main profiles with problematic uh, methamphetamine use. One is the uh, use um, of methamphetamine, of inhaled methamphetamine uh, within the Filipino community. Um, this, uh, this is called Shabu uh, within this uh, community. And Shabu consumption is embedded in Filipino culture. Um, we had so many challenges working with this population. Maybe we can uh, discuss them at the end. But one that I would, would like to highlight was the, the idea of building trust with this community and to be able to link them to drug services, to harm reduction or treatment services. 
The other profile that we have identified, and, and Alexis mentioned it as well, and Pavla also, is the chemsex user profiles. So for those who are not familiar with chemsex, maybe, I don't know, in the public. Uh, so chemsex is the deliberate use of psychoactive drugs to have sex between men who have sex with men usually, but we detected women as well that practice chemsex. And a number of prison studies have found that uh, TINA, which is the slang word for methamphetamine, which is the word that chemsex users use, um, is one of the most commonly drug used in chemsex se sessions. And so uh, the challenge with chemsex users, I think is the linkage to service as well, but progressively they are coming to our services. And I will show you uh, later on in a, in a next slide. So finally, a third um, more heterogeneous group, which is uh, the one we are seeing at the DCRs here is uh, this is called methamphetamine <laughs> in general, generically. So uh, this group is very diverse and uh, we are detecting that they are a little bit younger maybe and probably there are more women. We don't know yet and um, we are trying to figure it out as, as we are receiving them in the drug consumption rooms. So the next slide, um, I will show you some piece of data about um, what is happening with methamphetamine here. So uh, I will show you data on wastewater analysis. Uh, this data was provided by the Institute of Environmental Assessment and Water Research. Then I will show you data from drug check-in, uh, which was provided by energy control. And then I will show you accesses to the DCR and treatment demands. So this is the first slide. Um, this is a first burst eye view over the consumption or the detection of methamphetamine in wastewater analysis. Uh, for those who are not related with the technique, is the analysis of municipal wastewater um, and in which drugs and metabolites are uh, detected. And with the idea of estimating uh, the community consumption of different drugs. So here you see here the, the last decade from 2011 to 2021, methamphetamine was detected, was detected in the wastewater analysis and wastewater in Barcelona. Here you see that there are two moments of the time in which we sample the, the wastewater. One is autumn and another is springtime. And basically what we see here is the increase in detection of methamphetamine through the years with a peak in 2019 actually. Uh, during springtime. If you haven't been in Barcelona in springtime, you should, because there are a lot of tourism, um, a lot of people, uh, etc. cetera. So um, co I mean, coincidentally, the detection was higher during weekend days. Um, then the pandemic came and the detection was um, downward decrease. And in 2021, uh, the detection was almost one third of the detection in 2019. So um, we can say that we are in a situation that we are not sure how it will evolve. Um, so in the next slide, oh, this is Esther that is passing the slides instead of me. That's why uh, there, is, there is this lack. Um, so I'm going, here you are seeing the annual percentage of uh, MA medium purity. This is the, the data coming from energy control, which is the entity that does the drug checking in Spain. And as you can see here, uh, the purity of the methamphetamine is high 
and it was it is higher than cocaine from 2018 onward. Um, the other thing that we found or energy found in, in the samples was that the, the, um, there are few adulterants uh, detected in the samples. So, and most of the, oh, the few that act, are detected actually are stimulants as well. So it's MDDA, MDMA, 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 MDMA caffeine, ephedrine, et cetera. Uh, so it's a substance that is mm, less adulterated than other drugs here in Barcelona. The next slide it will show you what is the main route of administration. And this is one of the characteristic, I think, uh, that is different from one we, sh we see in, in, in Renses Republic. So, the, mo the majority of the MA here in Barcelona is inhaled. Uh, this is the percentage of visits to the DCR uh, in which we see that 94% of MA is inhaled by both men and women. And we also have the, the information from the front line that um, chemsex users uh, as well are inhaling TINA and they are also injected it, but, but they are progressively more engaged in inhaling it than in injecting it. So this is very different from the situation in CES Republic. The next slide is um, that I will show you is the number, no, this one, yeah. This is the number of annual visits to the DCR. Here in Barcelona, we have uh, a model, and I, I haven't said that, but here in Barcelona, we have this Barcelona model, which integrates treatment and harm reduction in the same center. And um, in harm reduction services, we offer a lot of um, interventions. And we also offer drug consumption rooms for injection and for inhalation. So I will show you data from the inhalation space that we have in Gasvaluar. Uh, as you can see, it's the, completely the opposite of what Pavla has shown because heroin is the drug that uh, produces the higher number of visits during over the years. And then you can see here the downward trend after the pandemic. And that's another thing that I would like to highlight that we managed not to shut down the services during lockdown. And, and I think that it was uh, an incredible uh, policy here in Barcelona, not to shut down the harm reduction services. They kept it open. And so here we have that uh, during 2022, one out of uh, over 10 accesses were done to consume um, methamphetamine. And almost half was uh, for consumption, for heroin consumption. Uh, this is men. And in the case of women, we have the same data. And we can see that from 2020, the, the upward trend of women uh, of the line of uh, methamphetamine consuming is, is, is up. And in 2022, one out of six more or less visits to the drug consumption room were to consume inhaling metha methamphetamine in the case of women. That's why we are trying to see if women are uptaking more the methamphetamine in, in, in relatively terms comparison with men. And the next slide, and I think it's the last one I will show you, is um, the, the relationship between the treatment demands and the DCR visits by sex. In this slide, you have on your left, uh, an axis that is showing you the percentage of methamphetamine treatment demands over the total treatment demands of over the total drugs. 
Um, and then in your right axis, you see the number of visits to the DCR. In green are men and in orange are women. And you can see that there is this uh, increasing uh, or upward trend in the case of men and women uh, asking for treatment. And this, um, the, the, the data show you this and the professionals told us that the the profile that are asking for help mostly are chemsex users. And in the columns, you see that there are a progressive increasing in the number of visits due to um, methamphetamine use. And as I said before, the profile which is um, accessing to our DCR are very different, are very diverse. And that's the profile we are trying to discover and try to uh, set responses to meet their needs. So that's why I will give the floor to Esther and she will ask, uh, explain some of the intervention and activities we are putting in place for some of the challenges we are having in managing the group who is consuming at the DCRs. Uh, so Esther, all yours. Uh, hello, uh, thank you to MCDDA for the invitation to, sh to show and to share our experience in Barcelona with med use. Okay, well, uh, we have prepared this figure that describes the chronology of actions around med use in our city. Uh, as you can see, no, our med story begins in 2015 when we detected the first med use in a DCR. At the beginning, people only used in LA route, as Gabriela said, they were mainly Spanish, between 30, 35 years old, and there was a presence of women. It's not typical when we detected a new drug in the consumption rooms that we had presence of women. And the, this first med users explained that there were few dealers located in the neighborhood of the DCR. During 2016, we designed together with Energy Control, the drug check organization, uh, the, motor, the monitoring strategy for, for the methamphetamine illegal market in our city. In the DCR, we started to offer drug checking service for each, each med use, uh, for each, each med use. In 2017, in the middle, uh, we, served, we observed an increasing number of people who reported using MET and an increasing number of MET supervised consumptions. So, despite the increase in these indicators, people from DCR reported that they knew more MET users who didn't come to the service. So, uh, the recruiting of this new population and the improvement of the domestic, domestic pipes were the reasons that promote a specific design of MET pipes. This design was carried out jointly with the MET users. Uh, we conducted uh, two, two or three focus groups and administered individual questionnaires about MET use, uh, paraphernalia, context of use. Finally, uh, users designed and, and we, the professionals, manufactured the, a ball pipe uh, that was exactly what, the pipe what they want. In 2019, I think, yes, uh, we started to dispense this pipe to use in the consumption room. And also we started to distribute the, the med pipe to use outside, uh, at home or whatever you want. Uh, okay, so uh, in 2021, uh, after COVID, no, in 2019, uh, we started the, the trainings. These trainings were, were to the staff and the topics were about substance, legal market, forms of use, effects, related harms, good practices. The idea was that all the staff was trained in methamphetamine, methamphetamine, methamphetamine. And in 2021, uh, uh, after COVID, we saw the med use continue to rise and increasing some related problems as induced psychosis. So after COVID restrictions, we started the community building work we contact to another countries as Victor in Czech Republic or another people in Europe 
to know his, his met experience and also make contact with same-sex uh, civil society organizations in Barcelona, mental health services in the city and homelessness services, trying to share information about the different contexts of med use because we, we, were detect, we were thinking that not only in harm reduction services uh, were met use. Now in 20, in, in 2000, epa, in, epa, lola. in 2022, we have, we have created dif different work, work teams operating at different levels. At the base, we work with a civil society organization and, and, the, and the people who use MET. In the next level, we work with another harm reduction services, gender services, mental health units. This level really requires a lot of work of sensitivity and pedagogy and, and education about characteristic and specific needs of people who use MET. For example, to establish accompaniment and support specific circuits for people who use MET and present psychotic symptoms. This follow-up uh, of the episode and the possible accompaniment to, to psychiatry service is carried out in more support than the rest of the people who use substances in the DCRs. And the other level uh, is with the public health agencies, as Gabriela or people from government, uh, where we were aspects of monitoring med use, founds, uh, these kind of things. Okay. A ver, it's not so easy to change the diapo. Eh? Okay. Uh, so uh, I have I'm going to show to show the different results uh, related with med use of the last year of 2022. In relation with the specific med training in, in this year, we trained a total of 33 professionals from harm reduction services only. Social workers, nurses, outreach teams, doctors, psychologists. I consider that the training of the, in the psychosocial approach to psychotic episode was very special of interest. Because often during the intoxications of methamphetamine, the benzo or, ant, or ant, uh, antipsychotic administration is rejected by med users. For this reason, we have focused on the, on the psychosocial approach because elements as the reduction of stimulus or trash or, or simple accompaniment also offer this comfort reduction. And sometimes it's the only, it, it, it's the only possibility to, 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 to approach. During this year, together with the public health agencies, we have planned to, to carry out a training course on methamphetamine oriented to all professionals of drug services in Catalonia. Vale. About the community building, it has been a, a focus, uh, well, the big focus during the last year. Uh, this, this community building has led from harm reduction services. We have created a, a network. We have shared the difference of and needs between med users in our city. Uh, we have included the different intersections as, as LGTIBQ, homelessness, Philippine community, gender, and also civil society organizations that work on relevant aspects as same sex, paraphernalia, treatment. The objective is to be able to cover the different spheres involved in the use of methamphetamine, not only the substances or not only the typical harm reduction strategy. In this community, we also include the participation of med users. Okay, next. A ver. Okay, okay. Uh, specific. Es decir, from, building, from community building, uh, we, we detected uh, the importance of creating a specific work teams to, to continue the work. Now we have five working teams where the central point is the use of MET and operating at different levels, as I said, and they meet monthly. Uh, at the base, we have incorporated an outreach team conformed by peers from LGBTQ organization and harm, and harm reduction professionals. They work at night in a traditional cruising area in Barcelona. On the other level, uh, we have a, a working conformed by camp sex organizations and harm reduction services, uh, a second working group conformed by treatment and harm reduction services, and one last group conformed by three harm reduction services, DCR, shelter, and housing first. Also, we have a group, the, 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 the working group, conformed by, by public health agencies, 
from Barcelona and, and from Catalonia and with the hub reduction services. Okay, about the no, it was the it, 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 I, I had explained the framework and now we, we, we are going to see the, the activity. Regarding the, the analysis of substances, energy control has analyzed 161 methamphetamine samples in Barcelona. The, the percentage of medium purity has been 69%. For cocaine, the other big stimulant in our context was 52.6%, uh, as, as Gabriela showed you. So, in the last year since Barcelona got better market for meth than cocaine because the price is very similar. And now in both cases, you can get a small doses. It's not, in, it's not necessary to buy a, a gram. You can buy five euros. So this is a special to be interested for us. Also, it's important to show that 62% of my users bought the substance to a trusted dealer. So we could say that there is a, sta a stable illegal market to get met in our city. Uh, it, in the last year, we have started with energy control uh, on-site analysis in the DCR using FETIR technique. Now, people who use substances can get a quantitative result for the sample at the moment. So before to access to the DCR, I can check my, my, my tracks. So probably in the next year, we are going to, we are going to monitor it. It's uh, very, very, very good, the methamphetamine. Okay, Esther, this is Victor. The time is running, so... Okay, the last one. Try to... Okay, in okay, okay, Victor, thank you. In, no. well, well, in relation, with, in relation to the activity, uh, we have attended 607 different MET users. We have distributed 1,528 MET pipes. Uh, this, these pipes have been dispensed in DCR to take away and also during the outreach interventions. Also, we had 4,115 accesses to use MET in the consumption rules, mostly in the inhalate room. Uh, but, coca but cocaine continues to be the most common uses of stimulants. 18 persons were referred to psychiatric emergency services for, for psychosis, mostly were women. Uh, women. Uh, we, an aspect that, that had been worrying us was the low access to a specific hybrid action shelter for homeless uh, for um, in people who use MET, this working group of harm reduction services concentrate a large, a large part of his force on understanding what's, what's happening and identifying the barriers. Uh, it's a very good result to have the, uh, DIRAP, DIRAP eight MET users to the shelter, and now they are all remain. And in the last year, six women who use MET had an emergency accesses. This data also is very important because the vulnerability of homeless women, victims of gender violence who use MET and present psychotic symptoms is extremely high. We are running also uh, groups with peers uh, from people from CAMSEX uh, for health education. And I finish, I promise. Our conclusions. We think that we think we think that we have three different profiles with problematic methamphetamine use in Barcelona. In these profiles, use is predominantly inhaled by both men and women. Available methamphetamine is a high purity, and harm reduction services are organizing a multi-level response to methamphetamine-related harms. But we have questions. These questions are. Uh, are women more vulnerable the, to the methamphetamine-related harms? Uh, how can we provide gender-sensitive services? Uh, are we meeting the needs of new patterns of use? Because we are detecting different timing, different rituals, and maybe we need a specific DCR. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. And, uh... Uh, and the uh, team from from Barcelona. Uh, well, uh, how much time has left, Marika? We don't have much time, so let's focus on the questions and and yes, exactly. <clears throat> right. Uh, so we have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, well, uh, well, th there is a vivid uh, communication in chat, but we are looking at the question and and, and so uh, I mean part so 
Um, have you found uh, any question interesting, or should should we go one? Can by I one? can I select some? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'd like already to say to the public that we will have another uh, webinar on methamphetamine. So don't get annoyed if we skip your questions now. Uh, there is one question by Rosario Sendino. Why do you think prevalence figures dropped that much since 2008? And then, uh, sorry, if you have already commented that she has lost it. This is for the Spanish for colleague. Uh, this is for Pablo, I guess, no? Yeah. Sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. So Pablo. If I, may, yeah. if I may respond, so it's uh, there is a difference between the surveys. So basically, the differences are related to the methodology of the studies. So we cannot uh, just say it has dropped since 2008, but it's it's also related to the methodology. What we see, we try to do surveys and studies in the long run to repeat with the same methodology to see the trends and. Just to summarize, the, the prevalence is uh, relatively stable, does not change over the long term. What we see from the surveys uh, more is a slight increase in cocaine use in, in the last years, which this could be a slight also uh, explanation for decline in pervitin use. Some of it may be substituted by cocaine use. Yeah, yeah, I can add that uh, if you look at the prevalence estimates of high risk uh, pervitin use, it's quite stable or, or increase is quite stable. And so this is based on indirect methods. What else, Marika? I see here the question yes. on you. You the... pick another, and you pick another question. Okay, I, I see the question related to the off-label uh, therapy. Uh, with methylphenidate in, in, in Czech Republic. Uh, so, Pavla, can you comment that there is a question on how the pilot, pilot uh, is going? So we should clarify that it's not like formal pilot project. It's rather off-label, documented off-label prescription, right? Would you like to comment on it? Uh, I would uh, like just to add that it was already announced that there will be a special seminar, webinar related to the responses. And I think everyone who will join this webinar will hear really a lot of details on, on this uh, substitution program in, in the Czech Republic, because I suppose there are guests invited from the Czech Republic to, to describe the study and the results. So I would rather leave the floor to, to the speakers for the next webinar, not to make spoilers. Mm. And... I understand. <laughs> just, to, just to comment on it, yeah, it's not a formal uh, project. Uh, for years, there is an off-label uh, prescription of methylphenidate going on. So there are case reports and case series reports, some of them published also in English. And if we have time, we can, or maybe Pavla also, I mean, shared in the presentation, we can share some some of the findings uh, published in, in, in papers also in English. Yeah? So, but it is, it is based on uh, off-label and uh, within the COVID, context, uh, Czech Society for Addictive Diseases published the guidelines for this off-label prescription. Yeah. Can I pick uh, another question? Yes, yes. Is uh, From the last two speakers noted the interest increased trend of presentations in consumption rooms. As Ireland moves towards supervised injection facility, it would be interesting to hear the types of intervention supports offered in that context. You probably commented already, just one one very brief uh, comment on that. <clears throat> I think Esther is going to answer this because it's the approaching that you are having at the DCR. I think regarding the harms, isn't it? Uh, or the, is it related with the pipe program they started? We can we can merge with another question by Matt Southwell asking. If you can say more about community participation approach within the community building phase, so that you put together the two questions about what you offer in this community um, approach. I have it. Yo, yo, I got me, Ravi. Okay, about the community approach, uh, really, it's really difficult 
Okay, it's a long, it's a long, long way that we have to run. But for us, in uh, for us with our harm reduction view, uh, we are we are opening the view, and we are we are. We have we 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 have groups no to to include uh, the all the all the intersections. This is the community the community building to 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 see the problem with all the with all the lines and and to create spaces to talk and and I and as I said it's a it, it's a it's a very important way to sensibility the the the, the people. It's not so easy and. But I think it's 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 a very good moment for us because we are talking with organizations that we never talked uh, before, and we are we are involving all the public health agencies that it's it's not so common, and we are we and we are involving different kinds of harm reduction services in the city that it's not so common, and I think that the. The difference between the other drugs, uh, we are involving users. Uh, we are we are recruiting users in the harm reduction ser services, of course, but also uh, with 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 apps, with uh, I don't know in the interventions in the nightlife. It's it's it's, an, it's an, I think it's different the, the community building that we are doing now. Thank you, Esther. Uh... I, I anticipate that the chat was very interesting, your questions marvelous, so we will try to save everything and probably get in contact afterwards. I would like to ask Alexis to say something, some conclusions, and he will thank on our behalf all the speakers, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Marika. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you, Victor, and all the speakers. This was... Uh, uh, this was uh, very good. So, felicitats, moltes gracias. Uh, I think it's a um, it's a fantastic illustration. Uh, I, I will share with you a few highlights that, for me, are very important and useful. But much beyond the the issue of methamphetamine, it's about what could or should mean uh, mean a, a modern approach and a, a development of responses to drugs today, building on the lessons learned uh, from, from what the different speakers have shared with us. Um, first is that the fact that we, we, we managed to have better and more data and information about the evolution of the situation is of course important. And, and you, you, I'm sure you have uh, appreciated with me that uh, uh, both uh, Cass Balluard or, or the check focal points, they, are, they managed to, to present you data about the trends in the recent years. Um, it looks nice, but, but I would like to highlight, and it's the same for all the services, that all of that costs money. So, so I think it's important to convey, and that's what we do together with people from the field and from the focal points, that we need to, to raise the awareness of decision makers. And it's again why, we, we disseminate as much as we can the, the narrative everywhere, everything, everyone, because the conclusion is, no, drugs are not only about injecting heroin use. No, drugs are not finished and have not disappeared, but it is a very dynamic market, but also it's a very dynamic and changing uh, situation for people who are using drugs. And therefore, uh, to be able to understand and to adapt the responses, it requires budget both for the monitoring and for the responses. So that's the first point. And, and the second point, and again, I, I'm, I'm a bit biased, biased because uh, I know well the situation in Czech Republic, but also in Spain, and more recently with my visit last year in Barcelona. Again, I think what we said in many webinars in the last three years, uh, uh, during and following the, the COVID epidemic is that what made possible to cope with the situation that was sometimes very challenging in some countries or some regions is the fact that we need inclusive policies. And I, I think the example of uh, Catalonia and Barcelona is uh, it's incredibly rich because of uh, the level of uh, community engagement uh, before 
because the the fact that uh, you have different uh, uh, organizations, different actors who are trying to coordinate and communicate. And I, I like very much uh, for that thing also the last comment of Esther. It takes time. So you cannot imagine you can invent a community approach within three weeks or even within three months. And, and we see that uh, in many cities in Europe, in the recent years, there, there has been kind of a de-investment in social services, in proximity services, including the police of proximity. And this means that uh, when you, you try to build the new responses, for instance, uh, for the crack problem, uh, maybe one day we come back to this in one of our webinars, even when the authorities want to take a quick decision, uh, you cannot get a, a quick support from the community within the next weeks. You need to build this partnership and it's a never ending story. So you need to permanently invest in that work. And this, is me this means that sometimes the responses that may be technically correct are, are rejected by the citizens. So we, we need to find a way to, to keep and maintain the community involved. Um, we need also to upscale the responses. What, what we see in uh, Barcelona uh, for, for many years, we, we have a fresh example in Athens with the drug consumption room because there is a space for you, the use of methamphetamine. And I think what is uh, important here is to illustrate that there was a question in the, in the chat or the Q&As about the drug consumption rooms and so on. I mean, you define the services in line with the needs from the population where you open those services. And there may be an evolution because when people and people who are using drugs, when they come to the drug consumption room, or if you meet them with street workers, um, then if you listen to them, you can better understand what are the other problems. And basically there may be as, as many different styles of drug consumption rooms as needed because it depends what is the local situation and what are the local challenges. So there is no obligation for drug consumption room to be only uh, for people uh, injecting heroin or even smoking cocaine. If, if one of the key problems locally is, uh, is uh, for, for the methamphetamine, well, uh, then if we, if we want to bring a, a, a response that may be useful, we need to adapt this. Then, uh, and, and of course, one of the things that is still, we have a huge deficit in Europe, uh, it's, uh, it's the services to women who are using drugs. And I remember from the, and I think Esther said something about this directly or indirectly. I remember from my visit to Casbaluar and in, in other places in Europe, um, it's true that there is a low percentage of women attending the services, but the services, because also of the other part of the male population that can be extremely aggressive, is, is means that those services, it's not their intention, but they are not always women friendly enough. Uh, so we need to be aware and to be aware is not enough. The authorities need to be ready also to finance. Okay, it's always a question of budget, but we need more specific responses for women. And in some cases, uh, we need to, to get an offer of services that is gender dif di differentiated. And then to finish, uh, the last point that, that is uh, well illustrated by the, the huge knowledge you shared with us with the different uh, experiences and the different moments in the history of pervitin and methamphetamines in Europe is the fact that we need we need first, we need to continue to invest and to keep the result of the evolution of the 30, the last 30 years in terms of associating people who are using drugs in, in understanding the problem and building, designing the responses. And there was also an illustration uh, in the presentation by Esther and Gabriela, uh, but I, I, I want to highlight that we, had, we made a, a huge progress in the last 25 years. But there are some risks that in the future, if you see the evolution of politics in some countries, uh, with some countries or some cities or regions where the far right uh, may be trying to, to come back to business or to policy, uh, there is a risk of more exclu exclusion and stigma for people who are using drugs. Uh, and again, women are more exposed than men uh, to that problem. So 
it's not that we have made no progress in the last 30 years, but now to make and to make sure this progress is sustainable and that we can build on that, there is nothing that is guaranteed or grant forever. So we need really to fight and to work together on that. And, and, uh, and this goes together with the fact that you gave us such a fantastic illustration of what is the kaleidoscope of sources of information that we need to combine together to try to have a picture that teaches not only about what was drug use four years ago or three years ago, but to understand what's happening today. And uh, certainly drug checking is a very important tool. And I can just say, if I compare with 30 years ago when we created the first drug checking program in Belgium with the marquee test, if you see all professional and scientific programs uh, like energy control and others have become this just huge and amazing. Again, it has a cost, but, but it's well worth the results and it contributes to produce a unique knowledge. But, but we need also to make sure that we articulate with wastewater epidemiology, uh, with other mode of interventions, because it will help all of us not only EMCDDA, but institutions, NGOs, actors from the field to make a better case for your work, for the need for responses, and also for the evaluation of the programs. And I think in the last five to 10 years, probably that's, that this is also one of the evolution I observe in the contacts I have with the member states, the questions they ask us, and also the actors on the field. In the past, well, those who created a needle exchange, the first needle exchange or the first drug consumption, consumption room, they were more activists. They were fighting for something. Uh, and therefore, they were not always interested in data collection. And, and I can understand this. But today, the decision makers who decide to, to take the political responsibility to create programs, they need also to justify the results. And for people from the field and the NGOs, they need our help to, to, to develop their own tools for evaluation, to understand where they are working well, where they can make an impact, but also to learn what maybe they could do differently. And again, there is nothing we can learn without associating and listening to people who are using drugs. So plenty of new ideas and very good examples for future webinars and for, to, for a lot of food for thought or, or interventions and considering maybe differently uh, what is our role when it is about monitoring, ensuring preparedness at local, national, or European level. And frankly, you, you, do, you do a fantastic job. Thank you very much.